Hey, 42 here. In 1992, a man was fleeing from the Los Angeles Police Department. After spending the night drinking with friends and watching basketball, he had entered his car and driven home. Not long after, two officers noticed his car speeding down the highway. Spotting his pursuers, the man sped up his vehicle and tried to escape. He was already on parole for a previous robbery conviction and couldn't risk a charge for driving under the influence. The chase was on, several police cars joined and eventually a helicopter was tailing him from above and after 8 miles of pursuit through highways and residential streets, the man was cornered. He was removed from his vehicle, reportedly gagged and forced to the ground and then the story took a darker turn. The man was tasered and for 15 minutes savagely beaten with batons across the elbows, knees and ankles, repeatedly kicked and dragged on his stomach to the side of the road all whilst, as multiple witnesses would state, the man wasn't appearing to resist. And disturbingly, at least for the police, all of this was caught on camera. The man was a black man named Rodney King, and the video of his assault at the hands of police was about to ignite one of the largest riots in US history. The footage soon went viral and charges were brought against the officers involved, but when they had their day in court, they were acquitted. The now famous footage had stirred up deep resentment amongst black communities across the United States, and the acquittal of what was obvious to everyone, even the president, as a violent assault, proved to be a step too far. Within hours of the verdict, the center of Los Angeles was swarming with thousands of rioters, engaging in arson, looting, even assault, in a prolonged expression of mass rage and angst that lasted six days. The police were completely overwhelmed with neither the manpower nor the resources to deal with it, and their police chief, Darrell Gates, who was notoriously aggressive and took a paramilitary approach to law enforcement, failed to de-escalate the situation. Despite King's now famous plea of, can't we all just get along, the riots escalated to the point where the National Guard, several law enforcement agencies, and the US military itself were forced to step in to end the civil unrest. When the dust cleared, over 60 people had been killed, more than 2,300 were injured, and over 12,000 arrested. Koreatown had been ravaged with destruction and, in total, the property damage across Los Angeles exceeded 1 billion US dollars. But on the bright side, there was no communist commune. Riots have long been a fixture in human society. In medieval England, it was illegal to not take part in a riot because it was viewed as suspicious. Reactions to extreme poverty, inadequate living conditions, unemployment, government oppression, corruption, ethnic group conflicts, or even the result of sports games, riots take several forms and typically exist without a clear leader, spurned on by an irrational herd mentality that cannot and will not be easily stopped. Riots are usually instigated by and ride on the back of a wave of primal emotions such as sadness, anger, fear, disgust, and even jealousy. But once rioting begins, the original message, which may have been positive and constructive, is often forgotten and consumed by base political ideologies and destruction, whilst the opportunistic herd loot and murder. And thus, riots can be one of the most terrifying forces of humanity one can face, and the consequences can be dire, far exceeding the depravity of the original injustice. With that in mind, what follows are some of the most terrifying riots in human history. It was 2002, in the Western Indian state of Gujarat. The Sabarmati Express, having returned from Ayodhya, had stopped near the Godhra railway station carrying a bevy of Hindu pilgrims returning from a religious ceremony. But on the station platform, something terrible happened. A mass argument broke out between the passengers and the railway platform vendors, and soon it became violent. For reasons unknown, the violence spread onto the train and fire broke loose, all whilst many were still trapped inside. As the conflagration swept through the train, nine men, 25 women, and 25 children all burnt to death. The instigators were said to be members of a Muslim mob. Widespread outrage amongst the Hindu community spread, with the target of its anger being the Muslim community and the government. The chief minister at the time, Narendra Modi, declared the burning an act of terrorism 
and local newspapers used his statement to incite violence against a Muslim community. Claims were made of a Pakistan conspiracy, and false news stories claimed Hindu women had been kidnapped and raped. The day after the train fire, precise, highly coordinated attacks began. Using government-issued lists of Muslim homes and businesses, attackers began to systematically assault the Muslim population, who, when they sought help from the police, were met with the response, we have no orders to save you. Terrified, alone, and outnumbered, the few Muslims who attempted to defend themselves were fired upon by police, and a few lucky ones found themselves protected by brave Hindus who saw no need for violence. When all was said and done, the riots ended with 150,000 people displaced, 230 mosques destroyed, 233 missing, 2,500 injured, and over 1,000 dead, with some estimates reaching 2,000. Extremely violent murders and rapes occurred, and there was widespread looting and property damage. Modi, the now Prime Minister of India, was accused of inciting the rioters. In 1863, the American Civil War was well underway, but the opposition that US President Abraham Lincoln faced wouldn't just be from the Confederate forces, it would be from civil unrest in none other than New York City. New laws recently passed by Congress had meant that men were beginning to get drafted into the war effort against the South in an effort to abolish slavery. But not everyone was pleased about this. White working class anger had grown in response to the draft, with the feeling that free black Americans would be extra competition for already hard to come by jobs, and that the poor working class whites were being sent to the war in droves whilst rich men were able to buy their way out of it by paying the $300 commutation fee, roughly $6,100 today. Why fight for people who will just take your jobs and leave you starving? Or for people who had paid money to sit back whilst you do the fighting for them? These were the thoughts swimming in the mind of the poor white population at the time. And as we've learned, huge waves of the population feeling anger and resentment isn't a good thing, and a huge race riot soon followed, with what started as a protest against the draft soon developing into savage attacks of white, predominantly Irish immigrants on black communities throughout New York City. The riots lasted four days. On Monday, the draft offices were attacked, with paving stones smashed through the windows and one building was set ablaze. When firemen turned up to the scene, their vehicles were destroyed and their horses were killed. Telegraph lines were cut to prevent warnings of the growing riot. Police were charged down, overpowered, and terribly beaten. Newspaper offices in countless buildings were burned. Numerous black Americans were tortured and killed. One in particular was swarmed by a mob of 400, beaten, hung from a tree, and set on fire. An orphanage for black American children was looted and countless businesses that promoted integration were destroyed. On Tuesday, social figures such as prison reformer Abby Gibbons were targeted with attacks, as well as white women who were married to black men. And by Wednesday and Thursday, the military had been called in, and after numerous clashes, order was restored, and the riots came to an end. When it was over, 11 black men had been lynched and hanged, and some estimates state that 120 to 2,000 people were killed and 8,000 injured. There were $83 million in property damage and many black American families left Manhattan for good, fearing, rightfully, for their safety. Now, you're probably thinking, what on earth could be worse than that? I mean, just imagine a mob of 400 people hunting you down purely based on how you look to vent their anger on you and kill you. Pretty horrifying, right? Well, imagine a riot that burnt nearly half your city to the ground and saw tens of thousands of people slaughtered that's exactly what happened in 532 AD Constantinople. You see, chariot races back then were a big deal. And by big deal, I mean a really big deal. Everyone had a team they supported who were differentiated by colours such as blues and greens. These teams were associated with gangs, political parties, religious issues, and more. The races were an outlet for the social issues plaguing society at the time, amplifying and heightening the divides between peoples 
and hugely influencing the ebb and flow of power between the people and their rulers. In fact, chariot teams used to shout political demands during races as they knew how much the imperial forces struggled to maintain order without the bread and circuses that the chariot races so regularly supplied. In other words, the chariot races were a goddamned powder keg waiting to go off. To add more gunpowder to this already explosive environment, the Emperor, Justinian I, was an unpopular ruler who had levied high taxes, gone to war unsuccessfully against the Persians, and in 531, when two charioteers were implicated in a murder, made the grand old decision of banning the races for a year. When you rule a race-mad population, this is not exactly the best idea. On the 13th of January, 532, race day finally came again, and a furious, agitated, and ready to explode populace began to stuff itself into the Hippodrome, which happened to be next to Justinian's palace. As the races began, everyone started to cheer their team names, but soon they began to hurl insults at Justinian, and by race 22, the whole crowd was up in arms, losing their mind with rage, screaming Nika, which means conquer. Within minutes, the crowd was assaulting Justinian's palace in what must still be the largest football hooligan riot in history. This would be like the well-dressed, enormous hat-wearing clientele at Ascot racecourses losing their minds and marching on Windsor Castle, an event which no doubt would cause Prince Andrew to finally sweat. The attacks lasted for five days, and the fires that spread from the rioting mob burnt half the city to ash, including the original Hagia Sophia, and killed hundreds of people. But the Emperor, Justinian I, convinced by his wife not to flee, had a simple response to these riots. Kill everyone. And kill everyone, he did. Turning the two teams, blue and green, against one another, Justinian sent Imperial troops into the Hippodrome and ordered them to slaughter anyone who was there, killing over 30,000 rioters indiscriminately and without mercy. Sure enough, not long after this, the Nika riots came to an end, but not before demonstrating that whilst race or religious differences can drive people crazy, nothing really ticks us off like not being allowed to watch our favourite sport. Thanks for watching. You can now pre-order my brand new book, Stick a Flag in It, on Amazon. Link in the description. Thank you.